Hi. Uh, I'm inspired by Doug by losing my voice here for a moment, uh, but we'll get going here. Uh, I'm Chief Application Architect for MAPR. I think I'm now trapped by having to be near the microphone. And that means that I get to talk to a lot of people, which is a great way to learn all kinds of things. I get to talk to people in many industries. We have uh, well over a thousand customers all around the world. Some here in Singapore, some in Japan, many in the US. And it's really cool to be able to do that. I'm also committer in PMC on, uh, as I say it now, a bunch of projects. Uh, some active, some less active, some more historical. Currently I serve as VP of Incubator at Apache, which means that I get to participate actively in far fewer projects because incubator is something that just keeps crawling along. People think that software comes from Apache. In fact, that's wrong. That's exactly backwards. Software comes to Apache. So for instance, the University of Singapore, the Singa project, it's a deep learning package, came to Apache. I was lucky enough to help mentor that. Uh, or Kilin came out of Shanghai or uh, Zeppelin came out of Korea originally. It comes to Apache, not from Apache. And it comes to Apache from people like the ones in this room. I imagine that if we have any, let's do that. Let's be John Burns for a moment. Who here has contributed to open source? In any way, tried it, given feedback, given patches, written a little bit of documentation, explained it, written a tutorial. There's lots of ways to do it. Say maybe a third or a quarter of the place. Who here's used open source? Raise your hand because I know you have. You too. Raise your hand. You. I know you've done it. You have an Android phone? Hit him. Hit him. Make him raise his hand. Anyway, he's, he's, he's recalcitrant, but we know he has. Uh, and as people say, I've got many hats. I do different things, probably too many. Uh, I'd like to point out that, that we have some books uh, available online uh, that you can give. We gave away all the books today, sorry. Uh, but Ellen and I were signing them for about four hours. We thought it was going to be during lunch, but that didn't work. And so we finished about 4.30. We have a lot of those books. We have six of them that we've written, Ellen and I. And there's a seventh one that she's written with Costas Tumas about Apache Flink. We have books written by other people on the MapR site as well. We give away the PDFs. You can buy the physical copies, or you can buy the Kindle copies from O'Reilly. Now, my background is also varied. It's universities and startups is the short answer. Uh, I've had five or six startups in the California area. Uh, I've worked with big data since well before it was big, in fact, when it was quite small. Uh, big has gotten smaller or small has gotten bigger, I'm not sure which. Uh, and I've been involved in open source well before the internet. It gives me a perspective on how these things work. It makes me no less impressed though. Uh, so let's talk a little bit. I want to talk today about streaming. Doug talked a little bit about the replatforming that's happening, and this is epic. It has never happened before at this pace. There have been replatformings before. If you think about it, there have been revolutions in computing and abstraction before. Think about the invention of accounting in cuneiform writing. That was the first virtualization of commodities. So little marks on a clay tablet stood for things in a warehouse. That was revolutionary, and it made big differences to society at the time. It made differences that extend all the way to the present time. Or you look later, there was a time when the first nation was destroyed by software. That was in roughly the 1400s when the Hansa League was destroyed by double entry bookkeeping and letters of credit. They insisted on payment in silver for all of the commodities they sent, but the commodities they sent were relatively valuable, so they took up as much room and mass as a load of silver, and so they had to fill their ships both directions. One direction, say, with furs and amber from Tallinn or Riga, and on the way back, they had to send silver. But the Italians adopted the Dutch convention of letters of credit, and they could send cargo both directions, and then they just made a bookkeeping change on the two sides, and they destroyed the Hansa. 
because of that software change. That's just software. They didn't have computers yet, but they had software. And you think about another revolution, the adoption of electronic computing in our daily lives. That's been massive change. The adoption of the internet, the adoption of SQL. These were all comparable re-platformings, how we rebuild the way we process information. Right now what's happening is we are changing from an idea that state is the primary concept in computing to one where flow is the primary concept. This is changing the economics. This is changing the shape of the economics. Every data analysis that you do has diminishing returns. Small data is typically the most valuable data. You, you do that first. And so as you build the scale, it flattens out. You have marginal returns that are less and less. And costs historically went up nonlinearly. That meant we could not escape that corner in the value curve until now. Until now, when we have computational structures where the cost goes up linearly and with a very low coefficient, and suddenly the optimum scale for analysis is thousands of times larger than it was. It's a massive change. And this is a change that applies to all industries at once. None of the previous changes applied everywhere. They applied preferentially to one scale of business, one type of business, at a time. So SQL took 40 years to adopt, whereas Hadoopish things, flow based computing in large scale, has taken, I mean, starting 10, 15 years ago at the very, very beginnings, but most of the world, most industries have adopted in the last five years. Bam! One moment in time, this is a complete revolution. And to me, the core of that revolution is in streaming computing. That is really where things are changing, and that's what I want to talk about today. But first I'm going to talk about what we do as a company. We are one of these evil people who make money off of open source. We give back in various ways, but <clears throat> what we do is build a data platform that takes different forms of con persistence and puts them in as first-class objects in the data platform. I could call it a file system, but that's confusing because it doesn't just have files. It has tables and streams as first-class objects. Now, the, the evolution of data persistence over time has been over 40 years or so, Linux, Unix, other systems, DEC had systems, and so on, but we've progressively improved the functionality and the interoperability of files up to this point primarily massively 40 years ago used to have a committee meeting if you wanted to use a file and you would have to have an after hours call person for your file <clears throat> you would have to have a contingency plan for expanding your file exactly how are you going to do that and you would have to have hardware budget authority for your file we don't do that with files anymore, and I don't think we should do that with tables or streams. But that progress happened over decades. Now, good and bad, but about 10 years ago, Hadoop changed that. In order to get a lot, a lot of scale, Hadoop gave up almost all of that compatibility, gave up on standard APIs, gave up on functions that you could do to files, like appending them, at high rates, like changing the middle of them, and things like that. Now that was for good reason. That was how we were able to get scale at two-bit little startups like I was working in. And it made a big, big difference. It was a good thing, but it made it much more brittle and specialized. What we did at MapR, I don't have the hat, but uh, we added back a lot of that functionality, that compatibility, while improving scale, and we've continued to do that as we change logos. The logos are not actually part of the change, but they, they illustrate it well. And the results are superb performance, massive performance. Here, this is a system with 40 SSD drives, NVMe drives, and 12 controllers, 200 gigabit 
network devices, and it's able to sustain reads from non-local reads of 16 gigabytes per second. That's 80% occupancy of those dual 100 gigabit networks. So that's cooking. This is 80% of what the hardware can do at all. And 40 NVMe drives of the fastest NVMe drives there are is quite something. So it's fast. It's scalable. We have customers with over a trillion files in a modest sized cluster. Scalable, two levels that we have never seen before. We have customers who are verging on exabyte storage. It's big. The way it works, and this, this will illustrate then later the use cases that I'm going to talk about, is we split files into pieces. That's kind of like what a lot of people do. These are pretty big pieces, and those are then stored in a large thing called a container. Those are the hexagons here. He these hexagons, these containers, are replicated across machines. Now, one cool thing here is that we have one extra multiply in the scalability. <clears throat> Hadoop, as it was originally built and as, as basically it's used now, has a name node, some number of name nodes, times the size of the blocks that it stores. That's kind of the limit of what you can do. Here we have two multiplications instead of one. We have the number of containers we can process times the size of the containers times the size of the things tracked by the containers. And by having those three things there, we're able to scale to much larger things. We also are able to delegate certain operations like the storage of metadata from the central facility into the containers. That gives us high metadata update rates and gives us much more uh, failure tolerance. Containers implement transactions, file system-like transactions, and these then also implement micro snapshots, which we can glue together into transactionally correct snapshots and so on. Now internally, the files are all, everything is implemented as B trees. Previously, file systems implemented things in inode sort of threaded data structures where the first few blocks were accessed nearly directly. The next blocks are accessed with two levels of indirect, the next ones with three levels of indirect, and so on. That was a good decision 30, 40 years ago when these systems were designed because there was not enough room to store the index of all of the blocks where they were in memory. That is no longer true by a, by a long shot. And so it's much better now, and also it's no longer true that there's a strong preference to reading the first few blocks in a file. And so it's better now to have a balanced structure like a B-tree so that we have B-trees of multiple levels, but then all of the blocks, except for maybe the first 64K, are at the same level of indirection because all of those interior nodes can be cached, and so we only have one disk seek anyway. So everything in MAPR's file system is a B-tree. Directories are B-trees where the indexes are hashes of file names. Files are B trees at the top level where we have the filelets, and then the filelets are also B trees where we access to the actual 8K blocks. Uh, containers are B trees where they access free inodes and things like that. Now we've added, in addition to this, not just files, not just directories, but tables. I mean, we've got B trees just floating around. Why the hell not? To quote a famous philosopher from Texas, uh, Kinky Friedman, uh, uh, not well known as a philosopher, but, but he comes up with great phrases like, why the hell not? Anyway, so we can build these tables, and we can build them in ways that use some of the advantages of log structured merge trees without the disadvantages. We have a thing called a twisted B tree, which only does anything like merging at the very, very bottom levels, which means there is never a large compaction. That's cool. And then we can capitalize on tables to build streams. But these are inherently splittable data structures. They don't have limitations about having to live on one machine. And so just like I had in the previous diagram, I can take a table and I can split it into tablets and then I can split those into partitions. Again, we have one extra level of indirections compared to, say, HBase. And, of course, all of these work the same way. You have these tablets. They're stored in containers. 
and they're distributed across the system. The only thing I've changed in the diagram is the tablets, the partitions actually, are colored little cylinders instead of the rectangles with files. And a bit more than that changes in the code, but not really that much. And this is an exciting capability. So we implement the streams in terms of B-trees. And the, the side effect of this, and this is where we go in the rest of the talk, this is the key point, is that in a stream, we can exhibit the, H, the Kafka A API. We're, we're very, very strong proponents of standard APIs. So we can exhibit the Kafka API, but we can eliminate entirely the limitation on number of topics. There are soft limits in Kafka on the number of topics to roughly 1,000 per broker, partitions really, uh, but in the limit that's the number of topics. Uh, it's a bound on the number of topics. And so this, this is either a zookeeper limit or it's a number of file descriptor limit. And it, it limits the structures that we can build in these streams. So I'm going to talk a little bit about several use cases. I'm going to point out first some characteristics, and that is you get use cases that are essentially already implemented without any changes. So for instance, if I do ls in my home directory, that's what's showing here, we see files, directories, streams, and tables. Just like you see files, you see streams and tables. And the file names are uniform across all of these APIs. They contain a reference to a cluster and a reference to a volume mount point. These volumes are the unit of administration. But the fact that all of the file APIs, which are POSIX APIs or HDFS APIs, all of the table APIs and all of the stream APIs, there's only one stream API, there's multiple of everything else, all share these same path names. So this idea of directories is ubiquitous. And that means that if you have some sort of application which is medieval, old school, and tied to particular nodes, you can now move to a universal namespace below that, and you can containerize it with throwing away a lot of the nodes, because now you don't really care where things live. They can live together. They can live apart. They just live above some ubiquitous storage. So uh, before you start, we're already helping you out, and it makes people look good. But here's another use case, and this is where we begin to see some, I mean, the first one is surprising to people just because they assume that big has to be nasty and unfun and not easy. But here's one where we actually use these changes in how the streaming can work to eliminate the database entirely from an obvious database application. So here's the idea. We have dark pool exchange of some kind where people, institutions are bidding to sell or to buy stock. And because it's off the exchange, they actually have to say, who do they want to <coughs> offer or ask about this? So there's one sender on average 10 recipients, a stock symbol, and a price, and a time. And so what we want there is to handle a lot of those per second. And we want everybody to be able to say, what's the last stuff I sent? What's the last stuff I received? Basically stream it to themselves. And what's the last stuff that occurred for this particular stock? Now, if you think about it, those queries are all, what is the last something. It's really a lot like streaming. It's not really a lot like databasing. And you can do it with the database because you could put a timestamp on everything and you could say select where timestamp is bigger than the last timestamp that I got where I'm looking the you know, stock symbol equals this. You could do that. But it turns out to be not not nice to do that. So uh, let's assume that we have like 10,000 senders, 10,000 recipients, and maybe 10,000 stocks. There's 12,000 stocks in the US. You might be a much bigger number of stocks. You know, like there's 4 million commonly traded financial instruments. These are like commodity futures, stock options, stock option futures, all those sorts of combinations and derivatives. So you need a big number of those. Now, the customer that we're talking to there tried 
along with one of our competitors uh, for years to implement this using HBase. The only viable implementation they have is in this fiendishly expensive in-memory database that's used a lot in New York. And here's the solution we came up with. The idea is very, very simple. We had a data generator that generates data. We took a sample day of trades on the New York Stock Exchange, and we filled in simulated bids and offers before each trade. So we would get the full bids, offers, trades, uh, tick data, or at least something a lot like it. That's about 300,000 transactions per second. So we have a data generator that fakes that at realistic rates, at rates that go up and down like they did on that story day in 2008 that we have a sample day for. And we push that into a, a stream. And we call the stream transactions. Of course, we call it something because a stream lives in the file system. So it has a name, has a file name, or a stream name. And that stream there could have lots of topics in it. It's like itself a whole Kafka cluster. And then we have a worker B, the transaction exploder there. And what it does is it reads one transaction, and it writes it to many different streams. It writes it to the stream that says buy stock. So there the topic is the stock symbol. And roughly every 10 seconds or so, it will write a little stock index thing that says, at this time, this is the index in this stream. And then there's a second one, buy sender. So there the topic is the sender. And in the bottom one, it will write on average 10 times by each of the recipients. This seems wasteful, but it's an interesting exercise and an interesting result. The result is that we wrote for every incoming transaction the same thing 13 times into different streams. We can adjust the lifetime so that the penalty is not 13x the storage, because we'll delete that some stuff pretty quickly. But that means that we have to do 4 million inserts per second to keep up with the 300,000 that are coming in in the middle. This seems extreme. But these are streams, not a database. Streams cheat and are able to support very high insert rates. And so this demo application, including a web server, including query that run in real time, including all the insertion, including the data generator, run on three small VMs. So the cool thing here is that we have an architecture that allows us to query this stuff in real time in ways that otherwise something that costs $100,000 per core and will only support a dozen or so stocks per core. So if you think, you know, 12,000 divided by a dozen, that's 1,000 cores times $100,000. So the alternative here is something that costs about three or $400 a month on Azure or AWS or Google versus something that costs you about $100 million to run in capital costs. That's a big deal. That difference, the roughly three orders of magnitude, this is not saying it's twice as good. This is not saying it's 10 times as good. We have roughly three orders of magnitude in price performance here with a very simple design. And the alternative design is not that simple. So the point here, more than coloring something red or coloring it blue, is we have a revolution here. This is mind boggling that you can do in two or three weeks something that took years to develop. And I can now do it. I mean, with hardware that I could practically hold in my pocket. We had, a, we had a cluster in our booth that fits in a little tiny briefcase that has three NUCs could easily have handled this task. A $2,000 cluster that could do this versus $100 million. This is a big deal. The system handles nearly 4 million inserts on three not even real nodes. Doesn't use a database. Now, that isn't always a good thing because we can't do arbitrary queries but we can do the queries the customer needs. And we could put a database off to the side and store that and do real queries against that. And these are also inherently real-time queries. The delay through the system is a matter of milliseconds. 
Archiving to compressed column stores is quite doable. We could do that too. We don't have to have a database. We could use files, the other of the three major forms of that persistence. And we could do aggregates to a database. Instead of storing the raw data, we could do aggregates, pre-aggregates by many different combinations of keys to live dashboards that could be interactively queried. Now, you know, I said stocks, I said senders, I said banks, but it doesn't have to be so. This is a very general thing. Here is the same thing, very, very much the same thing, except now I have machines in data centers sending metrics. And they're sticking it into a stream there called metrics, which is magically replicated using MapR wonderfulness to a central place. But the fact is we could use the same trick of a transaction exploder to push it to a topic which included data center machine and metric. And so all of the work that we have gone through over the past years to build a time series database is now being done inherently in the stream. The offset of the stream is a proxy for time. The stream is doing compression of batches of these records. And so I could s query a bunch of streams for particular offsets, and I can get all of the queries that I could get out of, say, OpenTSDB, except I now don't have any of the mechanism of TSDB that gets in my way. I don't have async HBase. I don't have all the serializers. I, don't, I just don't have most of the mechanism. It all just happens in the platform. So the thing here is that streaming pays off big in some pretty quirky and cool ways. Another example of this is big time IoT. So suppose we have 100 kilobytes per minute coming from cars or things. A million cars. Sounds big, huh? Well, not big enough. Whoops, that's not big enough. Customer wants 100 million frigging cars to report at these rates. They want multiple data centers. They want to know the state of any device at the current time. Oh, and it's history, too. Now, what the customer wants is to be able to have all of those cars report all of the time, not be moving all the data back and forth between data centers, but we can do that with streams using technology just like what we saw, except we have a little bit of extra mechanism here. The car is reporting into a data center at the bottom there, and if it's local to that data center, if that's its home data center, it goes into the uploads stream. Otherwise, it goes into the forward stream, which gets replicated to wherever it's supposed to forward to. And then we have a small process that puts it in the right place. So we can, again, use the mechanisms in the platform to build these really cool architectures. And we can focus on the hard parts, on the, the parts that matter to the customer, and not deal with performance. The, these things are wide enough. They can hold variety enough. And they're tall enough that we can't touch the ceiling. We can't touch the walls, can't touch the ceiling with these systems. We can build new kinds of applications that we could not build five years ago. And these are going to make a huge difference. One of the key design ideas here, microservices in isolation. This isolation lets us build in small teams at Silicon Valley startup pace. Even if we have 1,000 developers, if they're in teams that efficiently work at scale of five to 10 people, we can go at extraordinary speeds. So suppose we're gonna make a decision, a little fraud decision or something like that. It depends on the previous state of a card, but it depends on the current state. Classic way to do that would be this, have a database. Classic way to scale that would be to have many fraud detectors that share a database. Sharing database leads to fires, one way or another. Either the database melts down or we have committee meetings to decide whether or not we put an index on it like I want or leave it scannable like you want. These are not reconciliable discussions. We can agree on the general shape of the business events, but we can't agree on the details of how the database should work because that's an optimization that should be local. We should build it like this, share a stream, but inside the square we should have private database, private updater, private decisions, so that, you know, like a CEO comes in, the CEO, are there any CEOs in the room? Good. We can tell CEO stories. But uh, 
CEO walks in, right, and says, oh, you've got this cool database that's keeping all the state of everything. I would like to have a dis dashboard in the lobby that has little stars whenever the transaction comes through, wherever they are. CEOs do this kind of thing. And of course, DBAs at that point just go, oh God, it's gonna break it, it's gonna break it. Because, you know, now we have to have whoever runs the dashboard in the meeting, as well as all the people who actually do work and make money for the company, just because CEO wanted something glitzy. But with this isolation, with this idea of streams, remember streams are way fast, so we're not gonna saturate it. So we can just start adding on things like the dashboard process. The producer uh, for the stream will never know that we've added more consumers. It'll just be fine. We're talking four million with real-time queries in three VMs. If this is running on decent hardware, we will never know. And this is a way we can scale these suckers. So we just add another one. And notice they each have their own database. Database is the slowest part there, but it's now scaling. Oh, but the database would be big, right? Take our biggest customer. They're the biggest credit card company in the world. And <clears throat> they have like 100 million customers. For this sort of thing, you want to keep the last transaction, the last location, maybe 100 bytes. The database would be 10 gigabytes. <sighs> for the whole world, you know, it's like, oh my God, uh, we would have to store that, maybe in memory, or, or whatever the hell we want. Because it's isolated, we could have stored it in a database before, in the next version, we could, you know, I mean, the same diagram tells us how to migrate across versions. The next version could store it in memory, or in MySQL, or in Mongo, whatever we want. The database is private, that's an implementation decision. So convergence is what we talk about, where we think about all the different forms of persistence as tools that we can use as easily as we can use files now. The requirements are we need persistence and performance. Persistence because that's how we get isolation. Performance because that's how we get you to use it. I'm pointing at you, dude. Yeah, if it's not as fast as anybody can imagine, everybody's gonna have in the back of their mind a workaround, how they're gonna work around it because it's gonna to fail tomorrow. But if it's so fast that they can't build something that's faster, they just use it. Who here works around TCP because it's too slow? It's like, give me a break. Shades of 1996 where people are worried about that kind of thing. We don't do that anymore because it's fast enough. Nobody cares. Who here implements their own domain name server because they're worried that the real one will be too slow? Can't imagine doing that. That's so stupid. Well, we want it to be like that with streams. We want them to be infrastructural, just like the air. Do I care that those are the right molecules that I should have been breathing? Wait a minute, I didn't reserve those. I, I reserved these. Well, files and streams should be like that. Should be just like, who the fuck cares? My, I got bits. I'm gonna arrange them this way, let's go. We have to have platform security, it has to be built in. The, you know, I mentioned when Doug was answering the question about ethics, we have to provide the tools to let people implement ethics. We cannot dictate them, but we have to provide the tools that people can provide privacy and such. And we have to make this global. The data sovereignty rules, or just trying to build a real business, you've gotta scale it across legal boundaries, national boundaries, multiple data centers for disaster recovery, whatever these data structures are, they have to replicate magically without application people trying to do that because are there any application developers here? Well, I may offend you, but application developers never have the time, the budget, or the skills to do good platform programming. There's different skills. The CEO is gonna kill you if you spend time on that because you're not doing the features that add value to your business. And so this has to be built in. The replication, update, multi-master, global, across wherever, has to be there. So the lessons I've learned from this, and this, was, this is what I try to call a vendor neutral talk, in that I talk about what we do as a vendor, but I'm hoping that everybody walks out going, huh, that was interesting. 
That's a vendor neutral talk, no matter who you belong to or who you work for. If you walk out saying that was interesting, good to talk about, then that's vendor neutral. But the things I've learned, especially at MAPR, about open source, even though I've been involved in open source a long time, is that APIs matter a whole lot more than implementations. And this goes back to a lot of Apache mottos that didn't necessarily make, they made sense to me, but they didn't resonate. One of the mottos at Apache is that code is not nearly as important as community. You think, wait a minute, that's what Apache produces is code, right? Code is dead. Semicolons will never spawn users and developers. Developers can re-implement code in a flash. And often it's a good idea to do that. So the community is what we have to build, not necessarily the code. Sounds totally contradictory, because we as coders think about what we do as producing code. But in fact, what we should be doing is building community between coders so that none of us really have to stick with it forever. The community carries on beyond the lifespan of interest of any given one of us. And it's APIs that make that possible. A standard thing, so users can use something relatively stable. The implementation can change so that both sides can be satisfied at the same time. And we've definitely seen that. The, the POSIX API, HDFS API, HBase, the document sort of da databases, things we've developed like OHI and, and Drill and uh, Apache Arrow and, and, and so on. Uh, there's plenty of room to innovate ahead of the community in implementations, but we absolutely have to stay, no matter how close source you want to be, have to stay with open APIs. That's how we build a marketplace, build a field of use together. So that's kind of a, an emphatic talk about some weird stuff, but I'd love to hear some questions or comments. Uh, we have new book on Flink. Ellen was signing that today. We ran out. We have the older book on streaming thing. We ran out of that. There's a book on Spark. We ran out of that. But you can get them all online for free. So sorry we did that, but that happens every time. Yeah. So with respect to your 100 million car use case, yeah. let's say if the 100 million cars are sending IoT sensor data to prospective individual places, streams, yeah. I look at it as a nano basis as every stream has a nano database, and you can move by, you can get the status, which will be very quick enough. But what happens if I have a requirement to have, to know the uh, average speed of those 100 million cars out of the street? So the question is, what happens when he has to do a query out of those 100 million cars, other than what is the state of this car? What if he needs to know what's the average RPM over the use last day of red cars versus blue cars? Uh, and the CEO comes in and says, what about ones with chrome as opposed to plastic bumpers? Uh, things like that. Of course, there will be queries like that. If there is an ongoing need of that, we can stick it in a database. Especially we can stick aggregates in the database so that the update rate is slow enough. Remember, every minute, 100 million cars report, maybe not all of them are running, call it 10 million. So 10 million per minute, that's a million every six seconds, that's 160,000 per second. That's getting kind of cranky and fast for a database because there'll be secondary tables and things like that. But if we aggregate those down by 10x, by 100x, then it's yawn kind of speed for a database. So we can certainly do cubed aggregates in real time, and then we can just do those queries against a data cube sort of repository, an OLAP kind of repository. And it'll so it happens so fast you, you won't be able to blink. I'm saying the streams can build OLAP cubes with the assistance. Streams are transport. Processing happens in things like Flink or Spark Streaming or Apex or yada yada. There's a lot of those popping up. Um, and that processing engine, transport and processing, the processing engine can certainly do the aggregations, sliding or tumbling window aggregations to drop aggregates out to a database. Furthermore, it can even keep in memory those aggregates so that they can directly be queried. At the end of a window, you have a lot of aggregates that might have to be written even in incremental ways. 
So maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to make that directly queryable. That can be done. So, an in-memory database. But again, we're going to build a service, so implementation should not matter. Today's implementation may break tomorrow, but we will fix it sometime tonight. Yeah, in the back. For what? O data? Yeah, it's just a Ah, okay. So the question is about a particular self-describing data standard. Um, there's a lot of those lately, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, we've even contributed that. We have something called OHI, which is a very efficient binary representation of JSON that can be columnarized and uh, works with Jackson so that it's wonderfully incremental and fast. Um, there are standards for binary interchange. There are standards for APIs. And uh, it's very frustrating that there is not uh, one standard which is a really good choice in all cases. Uh, but that's the way I see it right now, is that we don't have a good answer yet. But. OData, which I don't know anything about, could well be things. But there's there's things from the financial uh, community, which are binary JSON operations. There's BSON. There's there's JSON itself, which is getting faster and faster to parse. There's all kinds of things. The only thing I would say is let's not use XML again. <laughs> How about over here? Any questions? You lose your deposit. How about over here? Anybody? John Burns is speechless. This is a, an epoch yeah. in history. Uh, I'm just tired. Yeah, OK. Maybe everybody's tired. I'd be happy to talk after the break, but we're going to have Paco talk first. And he always talks. He's good. OK, thank you.